Hello, fellow foodies. Welcome back to the show and thanks for tuning in. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, the host of Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. On this episode, we're going to investigate the secret lives of an order of life that composes creatures ranging from the microscopic to macroscopic giants. And we're going to talk about fungi. Fungi are everywhere. They coat our skin, they hide beneath the soil and flourish along the forest floor. They intertwine themselves between myriad plant species, both dead and alive. They are responsible for transforming rocks into soil, making medicines, psychedelic drugs, foods, poisons, and even ink, among many other roles. On this episode of Foodie Pharmacology, I speak with mycologist and author, Dr. Merlin Sheldrake, who reveals this hidden entangled world of fungi to us in his newly released book, Entangled Life, how fungi make our worlds, change our minds, and shape our futures. Let me tell you a bit about our guest. Um, Dr. Shell Drake is a biologist and a writer. He received a PhD in tropical ecology from Cambridge University for his work on underground fungal networks in tropical forests in Panama, where he was based at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. He is a musician and a keen fermenter, so we'll obviously have lots in common to talk about. Entangled Life is his first book. So, before we begin, I also just want to put this out there. This is hands down one of the best books I've ever read on fungi, and it ranks in my top personal list of popular books that I've read in the domain of natural sciences. I couldn't put it down, and I'm so excited um, to have the opportunity to speak with you, Merlin. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Cassandra. It's great to be here. Thanks. Well, why don't we start with the beginning? When did you first discover your fascination with fungi? There are lots of ways into this field for me. Uh, when, I was, when I was a small child, I was really interested in the way things transform in the natural world. You know, how does a log become soil? Um, or how does how the leaves rot? You know, this question of change. Um, I was always fascinated by that. And so any investigation of natural transformations leads you quickly to the fungal world being the great decomposers and recomposers of the planet. So that's one way in for me. And another way in was through symbiosis, the subject of symbiosis. I became more and more interested in my scientific studies in how, um, how plants grow and how plants behave and how plants do their plant things. And, and you end up very quickly back at the fungal world through that angle as well, because plants have fungi that live in their roots without which they couldn't survive. They have fungi living inside their leaves and shoots without which they couldn't do what they do. So, that's really where I got, um, that's where I took my study of fungi to the next level. And that's what I did my, uh, my PhD research on and, and continue to research that's these uh, symbiotic fungi that live with plants. So it sounds like throughout your childhood, you were very much engaged with nature and kind of observing and looking at things and bringing them home to experiment with. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and, I, and, and then things like uh, brewing, you know, I became very interested in brewing, which is another kind of transformation and fermentation as well, as you mentioned, um, is one of these transformations. I think about it as uh, rehabilitated uh, rotting or, or domesticated um, decomposition. <laughs> um, and these are great ways to study the, these, these, that natural processes, these natural processes which then become cultural processes in your jars and on your shelves. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And produce something delicious in the end as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. So before we get into a deeper dive into fungal networks, I wondered if we could start with the nomenclature around fungal parts. It can be a bit daunting, um, especially to anyone that perhaps hasn't been in a biology course recently. Um, so I'm thinking of major structures and their roles, uh, things like mycelia, hyphae, fruiting bodies, and so on. How, how do these parts relate to the edible mushrooms that we see in the grocery store on a, on a regular week? Yeah, so that's a, it's a really important place to start. So what we normally think of as fungi are, are mushrooms, and those are what you'd see on the shelves of the grocery store. And mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of fungi. So they're the parts of fungi that produce spores, and they're analogous to the flowers or the fruits of a plant. And so they're produced by the organism to 
to disperse, to spread these spores. And, but much, most of the fungi live most of their time as mycelial networks, which are these networks of tubular cells, which are known as hyphae. So you can think of um, hyphae as the building block of mycelium, and mycelium as the main structure of most types of fungi. So the, the fungi, we, the mushrooms we see when we go out mushroom picking or, or in shops are just this very small part of a much larger organism and a small part um, which has evolved to serve a particular purpose. But mycelium, which is this very, um, this very astonishing life form, this habit of growth, which you can think of as analogous to a tree so, or, or a plant shoots, shoots and roots, um, the part of the organism that's concerned with feeding, growing and feeding. And so I, um, I like to think of the contrast with animals, whereas and animals find food in the world and put it inside their bodies where they digest it. Uh, fungi put their bodies inside their food. And that's what mycelium is about. It's this way of insinuating themselves within their food source. Which, and to do that, they have to be very flexible and uh, fluid and have no fixed shape because, of course, their food has no fixed shape. So they have to have this indeterminate lifestyle and, and way of growing and exploring. So that's mycelium, um, which also, you know, there's many things that mycelium does, but at its very basic, um, very, very basic level, it's a, it's a feeding structure. And hyphae, which are these tubular cells which make up mycelium, are the very basic building block of fungi, and they grow from their tips. So we we call them tip growing cells and so unlike say a tissue in your body like a liver which makes more liver by piling liver cells on top of liver cells hyphae grow by getting longer and they can get longer indefinitely uh, under the right conditions so you can think of hyphae as these fusing branching tip growing tubes um, tubular cells so those are the basic elements of most fungal life. There are, of course, fungi that don't grow as mycelial networks, like yeasts, which remain as single cells. Mm. Um, and they divide by, by budding and splitting in two. And so that's a different part of fungal kingdom and a different way of being a fungus. Of course, there are many ways to be a fungus. And um, so those, yeah, so then there's, so spores are the way that fungi um, spread themselves from place to place and they're also the way that fungi manage their sexual lives and so spores are a little analogous to seeds and a little analogous to pollen um, in the plant world what else is there there's another type of organ called a sclerotium which is a kind of storage organ and and humans run up against sclerotia when dealing with some types of medicinal mushrooms like chaga which are sclerotia or these storage organs they're not true mushrooms and neither are they active mycelial networks oh interesting one of the things that really hit me as as i was reading one of the early chapters was how responsive fun fungi are to their environment and you explained an experiment that another scientist did where they basically took um wood material or a log and put it into the path of the fungus and then compared that to uh, basically just a, a block of plastic. Can you tell us a bit about this idea of how they respond to environmental cues in their movement and growth? Yes, so that's a very interesting experiment. And um, so, so they, they are um, experts at sensing and responding to their environment. Of course, any organism to survive has to sense and respond to its environment, but fungi, Fungi have um, very idiosyncratic ways of doing so because they have this idiosyncratic lifestyle as, as these living networks. So they've got to stay in touch with themselves. You know, one end of a network has to stay in touch with the other side of the network. And, and one side of the network might be in quite a different place from the other side. You know, the largest organisms in the world are fungal networks and these sprawl over uh, you know, 10 square kilometers or so. And, and these networks behave as networks. You know, it's not just um, doing, doing separate things in separate places, they really have to you know, cohere as a whole organism. And so the question is, how do they do this? And we don't know very well how they do this. It's one of these great mysteries of fungal biology, of which there are many. But 
One of the ways that they seem to do this, and this has been relatively underexplored as a possibility, is by sending electrical impulses through their hyphae, a little bit like the nerve impulses that we have in our nerve cells that we use to coordinate our movements and our behaviors. So the experiment you describe was one where uh, the researcher Stefan Olsen, a, a, a very imaginative Swedish mycologist, he had placed, um, he'd got little microelectrodes inserted into a fungal network and he placed a block of wood on the fungus and before he placed a block of wood on the fungus, <clears throat> the electrodes were reporting these, electro these spikes, they called them, these spikes of electrical activity, they had kind of regular um, bleeps or spikes on, the, on this readout. And then he put the wood on top of the network and wood is food for this species of fungus. And so he expected it to, um, to cause some kind of excitement within the fungal network, given that this is its, uh, its source of energy. And, and sure enough, the spikes of electrical activity started to increase in speed and they increased quite dramatically. So then he took off the block of wood and the spikes returned to their normal resting rate. Um, and then he put a block of plastic on. So he thought, well, maybe the weight of the block of wood was causing the fungus to respond. It wasn't the fact that it was wood. Um, so he put a block of plastic on, equivalent weight and size, and the fungus didn't respond. So he deduced that, in fact, it was the wood that the fungus was responding to. And it was responding to this wood because the wood was its source of uh, energy and what it would, in the wild, spend its time looking for. That's just, that's just so incredible to think about, yeah, these ideas of, of electrical signaling. I think when, when many people look at nature, they see plants and fungi as sort of inanimate, still things that aren't really active in the environment, but in fact, they're very active and they're signaling. And um, I really loved the chapter on truffles because it really got into that concept of plant signaling through the release of certain odors, which are, you know, basically through chemical release. And food chemistry is a big top, topic of interest um, for many of our listeners. Um, and you really got into this idea of tropical ecology and how truffles play a role there. Can you tell us a bit about that? And what is a truffle to begin with? What part of the fungus is it? So a truffle is a fruiting body. Uh, um, analogous to a mushroom, except that it doesn't poke above the ground. So it's a subterranean fruiting body. And so it's where spores are produced. And so the truffle, uh, truffle fungi have to spread these spores. They produce these spores in these subterranean organs. And then they're faced with the challenge of how to spread them. But underground, there's no, uh, they're invisible, uh, they're better in thick layers of damp soil which insulates them from um, the above ground world. They aren't available to air currents or wind. So they're faced with this challenge and the way that they overcome this challenge is by attracting animals which can spread their spores. So when a pig or a squirrel or a shrew uh, eats a truffle and they go off somewhere else and then they deposit the spores of the truffle in their feces. But to do this the truffle has to attract an animal. And so it's faced with the challenge of broadcasting a chemical summons in such a way that the chemi chemical will penetrate these layers of wet soil, will enter the air of the forest. And amid the, the busy, busy smellscape in the forest, a, you know, catch the attention of an animal and be so compelling to the animal that the animal would drop everything it was doing and go after and try and find this truffle. So it's an astonishing um, achievement, um, an, a chemical, a biochemical olfactory achievement that this represents. And I always think it's amazing because you know, the truffles that survive the best will be the ones that are best able to attract their most effective spore dispersers. So what we see here is this outcome of, of hundreds of thousands of years of entanglement between these truffle, these truffle fungi and animals. <clears throat> and animal tastes. And so I, I think of truffles as this kind of portrait, an olfactory portrait of animal fascination that's evolved over all this time. And when we smell a truffle, we're smelling this, you know, the, the fungus's version of um, this, this fascination um, for animals. And um, 
so it's a very amazing interplay we see here. Of course, you see similar things with flowers and, and insects, um, but so it's a co-evolutionary uh, dance. Yeah, that's, I think it's just, it's just blows my mind to think about this, that here you have this reproductive need, you're buried under the soil, how do you get out? You put out a signal to call forward an animal. And then there's another animal chasing that animal and that's the human, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and that's how it felt when I was out hunting truffles. You know, you have this cascade of you know, the dog goes after the truffle, then the dog's um the truffle hunter goes after the dog, and then I go after the truffle hunter, and then my brother who's there goes after me. And we get there and we find this truffle and, and a mouse has already arrived. You know, a mouse had made its hole just below the truffle, it had been eating it from the underside. So this truffle's summons had caused a mouse, a dog, three humans to coincide under a bramble bush on a muddy bank in Italy one autumn day. Yeah, that's, that's it's so amazing. And then to have that go from that kind of adventure all the way to a trader, the truffle trader, and then eventually to a very nice restaurant plate. I'm sure it's uh, fascinating. And why is it that you can't dry and preserve truffles um, why, why, are, why is the fresh truffle so integral to the flavor? Because the truffle's aromas are produced by active, living, metabolizing cells. So when the cells die, they stop producing these aroma compounds. So with some types of mushroom like porcini, you can dry them and, and still taste them, expect to taste them later. But truffles, a bit like matsutake, is a similar, similar situation where you need to have living cells um, actively producing these flavor compounds. Yeah, that's great. Well, I um, one of my my brother in laws in Italy. My husband's from Italy, and so I've and I've done a lot of my field work looking at medicinal plants in southern Italy, especially in Basilicata. And um, he took me out with him one time with his dog as he hunted for black truffles. So you have to have licenses for you know going out and hunting truffles. And just as you describe in the book, it's an incredibly um, competitive uh, trade because there is also so much value behind these. And um, what really impressed me on this, you know, <laughs> romp through the forest on a muddy day was how he was not only looking at the dog, but he kept watching the plants, the other members of the forest ecosystem. He was looking for clearances in the canopy. He was looking for other species of plants, in particular in combinations of species of plants, to find the best places to hunt for truffles. And I just thought that was a great example of how intricate those relationships are um, between, really between kingdoms and how how the truffles are tied to those specific environments. Is could you ex expand upon that a bit more? Yes, of course. Now, this is one of the really fascinating things about truffles and, and um, truffle culture. You know, there's huge um, efforts to cultivate truffles, and some types of truffle can indeed be cultivated, like the black truffles, the tuba melanosporum. Um, the white truffles that I was hunting in Italy, the tuba uh, magnatum, those haven't yet been uh, cultivated successfully. But there's this... Um, this race to to cultivate them and to create the conditions in which they'll thrive you can you can inoculate tree roots with these the truffle mycelium and you can plant them out that's all you can do then you have to let the um, ecosystem take over and if you don't get it right the truffles won't fruit and so if they don't fruit you don't have your crop and, and, and you've you failed um so cultivating truffles and, and and generally hunting truffles you have to think at the level of the ecosystem because no, it's not just a fungus here. It's a fungus connected to a, a tree. And then the tree and the fungus living together in a certain type of soil, for alkaline soil, um, with certain types of climate and certain types of seasonal pattern. And you just have to zoom out. The truffles affairs unspool into ecosystems very quickly. And actually, scientific understanding hasn't yet caught up. And we know remarkably little about their life cycles and their relationships to their so they're trees. But when you're out, as you say, hunting in the wild, you have to look for these, these plants, um, these combinations of plants, because sometimes it's about the plant indicating something about the soil in that place. And it's the soil that mm -hmm. 
Um, and sometimes it's the plant itself, these partners of the, fung of the fungus, the tuffle fungus, that you're looking for. And um, so it's a very interesting exercise for humans to tune into the lives of these um, unglamorous underground organisms because we have to really open our eyes and ears. Yeah, well, and it's, it's so beautiful to me because it's such a great example of how I think how I've observed many traditional healers in my, in my own research, how they explain nature and the way that they find themselves as a part of nature. And I can't tell you the number of people that have told me from my studies, whether it was in the Amazon or in the Balkans or in, you know, Mediterranean islands, this common theme of interconnectivity of life and, um, how that carries over into local perceptions of environmental resources and in turn impacts food practices and um, medicinal practices. And like you said, it's like in science, we just haven't quite gotten our grasp on that level of complexity um, because the networks are so extensive. Um, I'm wondering if in that line, if you could tell us a bit more about your research that you conducted in Panama. I know you worked on a specific um, plant species and you were really interested in some of the networks, the fungal networks linked to that plant species. How did that all tie into the forest ecosystem? Yes, yeah, so, so with truffles, these, these fungi are what we call micro, mycorrhizal fungi. So, Myco for fungus and rhiza and root in Greek. So truffles are mycorrhizal fungi, and mycorrhizal fungi are, it's a it's a like name of a lifestyle. And there are many ways to be a mycorrhizal fungus, but almost all plants depend on these fungi to nourish them. Um, plants exchange energy containing um, compounds like sugars and lipids with their fungal partners, and their fungal partners forage in the soil and give the plant mineral nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And this relationship is prolific. The, the history of plants is a history of this relationship. In the very earliest days of life on land, when algae were floating and washing up on the shores of um, rivers and lakes, the, this relationship is thought to have struck up at this earliest moment. And fungi already being on land were experts at foraging in this solid medium of the soil. And so, um, form this relationship with these algae and behave like their root systems and behave like their root systems for 50 million years until the ancestors of plants could evolve their own. So what we call plants are these algae that have evolved to farm fungi and fungi that have evolved to farm algae and it's an amazing example of ancient uh, blockbuster symbiosis. So truffles are one sort of mycorrhizal fungus. They, 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 they in there are a number of types of truffle but um, there is a particular sort of mycorrhizal fungus. And I was interested in studying a different sort of mycorrhizal fungus. Um, and these fungi that I was studying formed relationships with many of the trees in the forests in Panama. And so I was interested in how these plants and these fungi went about their exchanges and under what circumstances did the plants give such and such to the fungus and under what circumstances did the fungus give whatever to the plant and I was particularly interested in the ways that these networks might connect more than one plant together and uh, these fungi are promiscuous you can have one fungal network connected to multiple plants and plants too are promiscuous and you can have one plant connected to multiple fungal networks and what that means is that you can have a series of overlapping shared networks and um, this is the concept of the wood wide web the idea that uh, plants can be linked underground by fungi. And so I was interested in this and how this played out in these forests. And so to access these networks, I started studying these, um, a special type of plant called a mycoheterotroph. It's the name of a, a group of plants or a, a, a large, large-ish group of plants um, that have lost the ability to photosynthesize. So they, they're no longer green and they no longer have leaves. And this, these ones are starting a pale white with a blue flower on top, very striking and charismatic plants. Yeah. And they are um, very beautiful. And they, they survive by uh, 
pulling their nutrition from other plants via these fungal networks. So they were, I thought of them as periscopes into the mycorrhizal underground and, and because they had to survive by obtaining their nutrients from other fungi. But from these fungi, the fungi got their nutrients from other plants. So wherever there were these, these mycoheterotrophs, voiria they were called, I knew that there were active shared mycorrhizal networks. And so I, um, this was one of the things that I was investigating. Fascinating. And you mentioned a, a really peculiar term, the wood wide web. What is that? And, and how extensive is this? Yeah, so, the, so it's, a, so it's a, an affectionate term, I'd say, used to communicate the idea of these complex shared mycorrhizal networks. And um, these networks are amazing. So in different situations, they behave in quite different ways. But one of the things that is, uh, which is astonishing is that in some situations, you can have um, nutrients or energy, um, carbon containing uh, energy compounds passing between plants through these networks. So for example, in the forests of British Columbia, you might have a large um, two trees, one larger than the other, and carbon would flow from the larger tree to the smaller tree through these fungal networks. Um, it happens with other nutrients as well and with water and even with signaling compounds. Uh, there's some beautiful experiments with broad bean plants which are grown connected to each other or not connected to each other via these fungal networks. And if, if a bean plant is exposed to aphids, a pest, um, then the broad bean plant upregulates its defensive system and produces these defensive compounds. And, um, and if another, if it, another broad bean plant is connected via a fungal network to the plant that has been attacked, it upregulates its defenses even though it has not yet been attacked, suggesting that these signaling compounds or some kind of a signal or a cue can pass between plants through these shared fungal networks. So it's a big idea in ecology right now. I think about it like imagining that you were a extraterrestrial anthropologist and you've been studying humanity for the last few decades and you only discovered a few weeks ago that we had something called the internet. And it's a bit like this for contemporary ecologists. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and that's, that's really amazing, their influence on plant secondary metabolites. A lot of our medicines come from plant secondary metabolites, as well as from fungal metabolites. Um, could you give us any examples of, of those that you covered in the book? Yeah, well, one of the ones that I always think is quite a fun example, because it's this example that um, what of, often what we think of as plant metabolites are fungal metabolites. And Taxol, uh, the anti-cancer drug, the blockbuster anti-cancer drug, which um, was is extracted from yew needles, the needles of the yew tree. Um, this was originally thought to be a plant secondary compound, but it turns out on further investigation that it's a, they're produced by the fungi that live in the yew needles, the endophytic fungi that live in the yew needles. So, um, and it's only produced by these fungi when in combination with the yew tree, the yew plant, the yew cells. So, these chem chemicals often arise as a result of a symbiosis. And, um, and so I think there are probably many other examples of, of um, what we call plant secondary metabolites that are actually, actually fungal. Yeah. Um, but of course there are many, I mean, alcohol is, is, a, is a fungal compound, the statins, um, the drug, are, they're a fungal compound, penicillin, many other antibiotics, fungal compounds. Um, citric acid is produced by uh, aspergillus fungi and using all fizzy drinks. Um, it's an, you know, there's a, a huge list of fungal metabolites that play a major role in human life and have done for quite some time. So we know for plants, many of those secondary metabolites are used in defense um, against pests or disease. Why are fungi producing these compounds? Do they need antibiotics to survive in their environments? Yes. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question, of course. So, so then with the penicillin molds, um, when these fungi are vulnerable to bacterial attack, just as we are, and you know, fungi have bacteria living inside them, they have a microbiome like we do, and they're also vulnerable 
to bacterial infections just like we are and so um, because these fungal mycelia are uh, insinuated in their environment these they're just one cell sick so they've got a lot of surface area which is the whole point of being able to um, that's why they produce these networks to have surface area to digest their environment but that surface area makes them vulnerable to attack as well because there's a lot of ports of um, contact so the penicillin produced by these penicillin molds uh, is, a, is a way for the fungus to defend itself against bacteria and so when we use penicillin produced by a fungus we're rehousing a fungal solution within our own bodies um, and so in that case there's a very clear way that the penicillin is of use to the um, the fungus in in other cases you know, fungi produce compounds for defense as well a bit like plants and these can be useful to us in other ways so i'm wondering what are your thoughts on the rampant use of antifungals in industrial agriculture i know that from the perspective of human health there have been some rising concerns around aspergillus um you know multi-drug resistant aspergillus infections that are resistant to azoles and things and i mean how do you think that human interactions or interference with fungi and in, in the environments impacting our health so for a start in general this kind of approach to um agriculture that the the um, the kill the bad guy approach we know is not always very effective um as you can see from the widespread application of antibiotics um which are causing all sorts of problems and perhaps um, haven't yet caused their largest problem which would be a, a massive pandemic of antibiotic resistant superbugs we're basically selecting for superbugs on a major scale by applying blanket and indiscriminately these antibiotics and it's a bit like that with these antifungals apart from the fact that all plants need fungi and by applying antifungals we'll be damaging these relationships that the plants have with their microbiomes their fungal microbiomes um, we're producing resistant superbugs which can cause pandemics the, the cavendish which is the most um, which makes up 99 percent of all banana exports it's a variety of banana um, is being decimated right now by a fungal disease and faces extinction in the coming decades and that's just one example. There are a number of other fun, uh, antifungal resistant superbugs which are um, which are rising up. So I think it's a um, a major problem, and not a problem that we're going to get out of by applying yet more antifungals. Yeah, yeah, and and the example of the banana is such a great one because we've already been down that road before as well with the Big Mike banana and Grand Michel um, that also succumb succumbed to. Um, fungal disease I think it was back in the maybe the 1950s it, you know it was with them absolutely yeah yeah it's a perfect a textbook example of the vulnerable um, the vulnerability of having monocultures you know if we all yes. use one type of banana then it all gets wiped so we have to have another one we choose another we don't have a plurality of bananas which is what we should do what people have used traditionally you know um, so we keep insisting on these monocultures and as long as we do so we'll be vulnerable to their wipeout mm -hmm. yeah and that's where i mean biodiversity is so essential when it comes to securing our, our our food systems for the future and i think or my hope is that in the future we'll think not just about crop biodiversity but also those other interactions that are happening with those crops because as you so beautifully illustrate it's not just about the plant there are also you know these um, really important um, fungal networks involved in um, in ensuring the health um, of these species absolutely um, well I want to shift for a moment towards another medicinally active group of compounds and you explored this a bit both from the stance of, of a scientific perspective and also from your own experience um, through a clinical trial um, where you were given um, uh, LSD which is a compound derived from ergot right? Absolutely yes um, it was derived from ergot 
um, and from ergot alkaloids, which had been used for many centuries by midwives um, because they're so useful in, in both inducing uterine contractions and in stopping postpartum bleeding. Mm. So these key tools of midwifery, um, which is why, in fact, Hoffman, Albert Hoffman, the discoverer of LSD, was researching them in the first place because he was charged by Sandoz Laboratories to look into these ergot alkaloids to try and produce some new obstetric drugs from them, given their long history of traditional obstetric use. Yeah, and ergot, what kind of um, symptoms would people have if they had accidental consumption of ergot? Especially, this is an issue, especially in, in the past. Yeah, it's a grisly list of symptoms. Um, sometimes it was referred to as St. Anthony's fire because of the burning sensation in your limbs. Uh, convulsions, hence convulsive ergotism. Um, so in the sense of rising, nightmarish visions, um, a sense of, yeah, a sense of unbearable burning. Not fun. Not fun at all. And this is different, though, from the experience of LSD, I'm assuming. And <laughs> in, your, in, your, in the experiment that you took part in, you were basically tasked with taking this and considering a difficult scientific problem to try to understand if this you know, fungal compound could influence how your brain approaches problems. And what was that experience like? And did you find that it helped you to solve some of the big riddles you've been working on? Yeah, so it was a fascinating study like that because um, they'd, they'd recruited all sorts of scientists and mathematicians uh, from around the country and, and asked them to come up with you know, one of these recalcitrant problems in their inquiries that they hadn't been able to crack, that they were wrestling with. Um, I think of them as these knots that they'd been struggling to untie. And so then we were given LSD and each, everyone had their rooms, different cohorts came at different times and you had a room um, with a bed and then you had a little desk with some colored crayons and paper, paper and everything you might need to be creative. It was quite, quite funny, um, actually. And so then we were given the LSD and then asked, gently reminded at some point when we'd um, well into our, our trip um, to start thinking about our work related problem as they called it and um, I wanted to think about these relationships that fungi have with the voria the, the pale white non-photosynthetic plants that I'd been studying because I wanted to think in a different I wanted to try and approach these relationships from a bigger point of view I'd been thinking about them in this very transactional way as the plant gives carbon to the fungus and the fungus gives minerals to the plant in a strict exchange but I want to ask you know and think about what it what the plant might offer the fungus that wasn't a strict nutritional exchange so I was I was trying to send my mind down into the soil you know and and to to really try and <clears throat> try and relax some of my preconceptions about this relationship and see if I could approach it from new angles and I found it very helpful you know I had a very vivid experience of um, of being in this bustling soil with this you know, sort of wild west it was um, enormously busy and, and terrifyingly busy place which of course it is the soil is astonishing wilderness you know, yeah. huge diversity in the soil and um you know metabolic cycles spinning at huge rates and it's um it's not some um vacuum not some dead place and this is one of the great wildernesses of the planet and um, so, yes, I had this very vivid experience of being in the soil. And I mean, this is, these are just you know, my visions, so they're not, um, this is by no means some sort of evidence or factual proof, but it was very helpful for me to, to loosen some of my preconceptions, for sure. That's great. That's great. I think it, it must have been a really fascinating experience to, to to mentally journey through through that. It really, like you said, is one of the great underexplored areas of the planet. We've been to the mountaintops and I think the ocean still, there's a lot that remains to be explored, but also, you know, the subterranean exploration is really maybe the next frontier as well um, because of all those fascinating networks that are interlinked and connected. How, mm -hmm. how does how does LSD compare to psilocybin, which is another um, fungal product that's you know 
the common term for the source of this is magic mushrooms, but how do those compare to one another? So they're both in the same family of psychedelic. They're both serotonergic psychedelic, so-called, because they um, bind to serotonin receptors in your brain, in your body. Um, they have different, subtly different effects. Um, and if you eat magic mushrooms, it's going to be different from LSD as well, because in the mushroom, there are all sorts of, there are, you know, cocktails of chemicals which affect you in subtly different ways alongside the, the ringleader, uh, psilocybin. I um, mean, LSD, you have just a single purified chemical. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, they're, they're, they're cousins um, as psychedelics and, um, and both induce um, often profound altered states. And, and is, in psilocybin, this has had the most recent research done on it, in part because the stigma surrounding LSD, those three dangerous letters, uh, were inherited from the um, brouhaha of the 60s, um, has led to um, uh, permit awarding agencies uh, to, to, um, to have some caution about it still. So psilocybin is more easily worked on um, in, this, in this climate right now. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I loved your description too of some of the earlier studies, including those by um, ethnobotanist Richard Evans Schultes and his work in Mexico. Um, he has a dear place in my heart because he's my academic great grandfather. <laughs> so, oh, wow. so I was like, "Yay, ethnobotany is in the book as well." <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's great. So, who's your who's your academic parent then? Uh, my parent is um, Bradley Bennett, and then he was oh. trained by Michael Balick, who was trained directly by Schultes. So, okay, yeah, great. part of the uh, tree. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. No, Schultes is a real um, a real hero. Yeah. Well, his work mm -hmm. was just, I mean, not only in Mexico, but also his work um, in the American West. And of course, the many years he spent in Colombia and throughout the Amazon um, really changed the way we think about um, useful plants and especially psychedelic plants and entheogens. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I've just um, published a paper on, on one of these enigmas he presented about why it was that local Amazonians could distinguish between multiple varieties of ayahuasca van that he wasn't able to tell apart. Mm, interesting. Um, which raises so many questions about how we perceive and how we notice and how we categorize the natural world, um, all, these, all these things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many questions that remain to be answered and explored um, and interrogated. I, I feel like there's just something that nature can teach us at every turn. And as you mentioned with the, when it comes to plants and bioactive compounds, sometimes it's like peeling back that layer of the onion. And in some cases it's the plant producing the compound. In some cases it's a fungus that's living within the plant, or sometimes you need both the plant and the fungus to yield those. Um, mm. Or you need the, mm -hmm. all the bacteria living inside the fungus, living inside the plant, <laughs> or the virus inside. And there's a great study that came out in, um, few years ago published in science for the they found that a tropical grass could only grow in this hot soils if it had a fungus living inside it but they found that if the fungus didn't have a particular virus living inside it then the plant couldn't grow in the hot soil so it wasn't the fungus alone that supplied this ability it was the virus inside the fungus inside the plant <laughs> yeah it's microbiomes are playing such a big role i think uh in so many different ways, not only in, in our guts. I think a lot of people are familiar with the gut microbiome and the impact that has on our health. But yeah, within the, within the natural world, there's so many examples of, of tiny worlds, tiny ways that they're interacting with one another. Um, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. well, and one other one that I, I loved your discussion on lichens as well. Maybe could you tell us a bit about those types of organisms and what is that relationship like? Yes, yeah, so lichens are the lichens are these. Um, you, you would have seen them on the fence posts and roofs and stones and cliffs and high tide lines. Um, they they all they go by without being noticed very often, um, or they're sort of a some kind of lower plant. But they're these very amazing organisms that have really overturned the way that we think about 
uh, life in many ways, actually. In the 19th century, a, a Swiss botanist called Simon Schwendener, studying lichens, made the observation that they seem to be composed of two organisms, an alga and a fungus. And to the rest of the lichenologists who were part of the world of botany studying these lower plants, this was a preposterous idea because they thought they, they thought of them as plants. And what's more, at the time, there was no way to think about the intimate sharing of bodily space uh, other than as parasite, parasitism or disease. So when Schwendener suggested that this might be a mutually beneficial symbiosis, or at least one that could create a, um, a stable relationship, people were shocked and appalled. Um, so then it was a few years later in study of these lichens that um, another biologist called Frank um, coined the word symbiosis to describe the living together of unlike organisms. And, and lichens then became this type case in interkingdom collaboration and uh, really allowed people to start investigating the world in different ways because we had words to describe uh, the uh, you know, mutually beneficial relationships, relationships that weren't just disease and weren't just parasites. Yeah, there's, there's one other case I want to end with, and then, I, then I'm going to stop there because I, I want people to, to get the book and read it because there's so many great stories in there. But we have to talk about the zombie ants. <laughs> <laughs> that was just such an impressionable story. I'm like, oh my gosh, I I, I can't believe this is happening in the natural world, but I can believe it. Tell us about that. Like what's <laughs> happening there? So there's some types of fungi, quite a, long, a lot of fungi actually, and um, have, that have evolved an ability to infect insects and grow within insect bodies and to puppet insect behavior for their own benefit. And the best studied examples are a fungus called Ophiocordyceps, uh, which infects carpenter ants. And, uh, and this, so this, this is just one example across the natural world. There are fungi that infect cicadas, uh, all different types of ants, spiders, caterpillars, um, grasshoppers, you name it. But in this case, these ants normally stay down low on the forest floor, made out of sight and safe, uh, relatively. Um, but when they're infected by the fungus, their behavior changes and they, the fungus overrides their instinct and causes them to be fascinated by height and by light. And so they climb up the stalks of plants and they bite on with something called a death grip to the veins, the underside of leaves. And at that point, the fungus kills them and then sprouts a stalk out of their head and rains down spores on ants passing below. Um, well, what's amazing is the precision with which these fungi are able to control ant behavior. And uh, really, people think about this as, a, um, as fungi in ants' clothing. You know, the, the ant stops behaving like an ant. It veers off the tracks that guide its behavior as an ant and its relationships with other ants, and it veers onto the tracks of the evolutionary story of the fungus that's infecting it. The fungus is, is piloting this ant's body. And... Um, which makes, you know, from a fungal point of view, it's a brilliant evolutionary innovation because the fungus doesn't have a twitchy muscular body or an ability to walk or bite or fly. Um, and it would take a long time to evolve those abilities. And to do so, the fungus would have to sacrifice all of these amazing um, flexibilities and these options that it has as it is. Um, so it borrows one, borrows an animal's body and, and manipulates it for its own ends. And, and it's really... Um, it's really an astonishing thing that the fungus can do this. And we're still not quite sure exactly how, but it seems to be a pharmacological thing. So the fungus grows inside the ant's body and releases chemicals that act on the ant's nervous system. Um, and possibly even the fungus interposes itself between the ant's brain and the ant's body and, and puppets its muscle contractions directly. We're not quite sure if that's the case, but it might be. Um, or it might just be that the fungus produces chemicals which act on the ant's brain, which then acts on the ant's muscles. But either way, it's a remarkable example of uh, a sort of co-creature, a composite organism, a sort of shape-shifting um, composite creature. It sounds like something from like a sci-fi alien movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just one example of how amazing um, this order of life is there's so many uh so many different paths that they take and so many different capacities that i think that 
for many years, no scientist could have ever dreamed that they had those, those capacities. So fascinating. Well, congratulations again on a most excellent um, book. And thank you so much for coming on the show. I learned a lot and I'm sure the audience did as well. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm Dr. Cassandra Quave, and you're, you've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded on Zoom from home during the COVID-19 isolation period. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcast or any major podcast streaming service. You can also find a full list of our episodes with links at our website at foodiepharmacology.com. You can find the book Entangled Life discussed on this episode with any major bookseller. Links to the book and Dr. Sheldrake's website and social media platforms are also available on the Foodie Pharmacology website. We've got a great lineup of topics and shows for you this season, so please take a moment to share the link to the show with your friends and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.